So I'm going to be going over maximizing real-time data processing with Apache Kafka and InfluxDB, a comprehensive guide. Those are a lot of words. We're basically going to be going into how Influx and Kafka work together, what they are and what they are not, and a few project examples that you can take from this uh, presentation home with you. As he said, my name is Zoe Steinkamp. I'm a developer advocate at my company, Influx Data. We are the creators of InfluxDB. Please feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn if you don't feel comfortable asking questions here or if you just feel like it. Either way works. So the agenda today. So we're going to quick do an introduction to time series databases because this is the main question I get asked, funny enough, all the time. Uh, we're going to do a quick introduction to InfluxDB v3 and kind of how it compares within time series. Introduction to Kafka and Telegraph, which is an open source ingestion agent. Some company examples of how they use uh, Kafka and Influx together. And how Confluent supports InfluxDB. And a few resources towards the end. So why a time series database is important. So for quick uh, note here, time series data is almost always based on time. I know, what a shocker. So basically, it's normally things like hours, minutes, seconds, and nanoseconds. In case you're curious, the most common is going to be seconds. And the sources can be anything from infrastructure, like, for example, the servers that we monitor day in and day out. And more likely, it's actually something in the real world, like your Fitbit. It's a great example of time series data. That's all it's producing when it's tracking you throughout the day. That's pretty much exactly what it's doing, is figuring out how long you held that elevated heart rate minute, how deep was your sleep, and for how long was it. That's all time series. Now, that being said, when it comes to time series data, what I just mentioned is called metrics. Those are quantitative values that you are collected regularly over time, like for how long you sleep. Events, though, are irregularly collected over time. So that's going to be something like you're tracking a button on your website. You just want to make sure it works. You're just kind of keeping track. But the button's not pressed like all day. There's not just a robot clicking on it all day. Instead, it's you know, clicked randomly, irregularly. It's just whenever someone happens to interact with this. And that can be real in like a IoT sense as well, but it is more common in like the internet. Traces are normally complete events. For example, an obvious one here is a stack trace. So with that, it is still normally a time series piece in that the stack trace has happened at this exact time. The biggest difference here between traces and, for example, a metric is that they tend to have a lot more tags and metadata attached to them. A metric can be extremely basic. It can literally just be, at this time, the temperature was a value. That can be all it is as far as metrics goes. But traces are normally complete events. You're going to get a lot more information off of them. So when it comes to time series databases, and this is fun because some of these other DBs are actually here with us, but I always kind of like to point out that databases are sometimes very broad in what they can do. Sometimes they're very specialized. Postgres, for example, or just in general, SQL DBs make up approximately 90% of data stored in the world. So in case anyone's curious, like SQL DBs are definitely the most popular. And everyone here, for the most part, knows when you would appropriately use them, things like records that you, you know, want to keep. Like, for example, InfluxDB keeps customer records. Then you have your document DBs. That's going to be things like Mongo. Obviously good for more than documentation, but without a doubt that it was definitely like where they came on the scene. That's their bread and butter. That's what they're really known for good use of. They can also be used for time series data sometimes. You also have Elastic, which is known as things for like searching, et cetera. And then you have time series. So the thing with time series is that we don't store documents. It's not what we're for. I don't ever suggest you store things like a record in us, per se, unless you know it's like a timestamp record. And even then, it should be a metric or an event, et cetera. Basically, we are a niche that we fit really well, but it is good to be aware that we don't replace these other ones. I would never normally say we replace a Mongo or an Elastic or anything like that. What they do is special, just like what we do. And here's just a quick use case, and also some of the things that are major issues. And this can be something that's also relevant here as well when it comes to Kafka streaming. Ingest, a high amount of data streaming in at, at times nanosecond precision. Not every DB is set up for that, because that's just not always what they expect to be dealing with. Compression, the ability to store this large data set without breaking the bank is really important because, again, if you're dealing with nanoseconds, you're going to be dealing with like a billion things by the end of a day. That grows quite exponentially, especially if you're not compressing it down super well. This is actually where a lot of people run into issues with SQL DBs full of time series data is they tend to explode in size. And funny enough, SQL DBs aren't really meant for dropping or deleting data. That's not really what they're for. So 
people just end up normally accidentally nuking their databases and trying to making them smaller. Cardinality. This is when you need to store wide rows, timestamp data with tons of values. Those are those traces I was talking about before. So instead of, like I said, a simple temperature with a value, you're talking about like 60 values, 60 different little pieces of information that need to be uh, stored. And querying on time instead of something like an index or a value, which is obviously a lot more common in databases is instead of uh, a time, you're going, I want Alex's information or I want row column two, which is attached to row column 22 in this other table that I've got. That's not how it works here. This is all about time. What was the past 30 days value? What was the average of that value, et cetera? And although this is specific to Influx, this is without a doubt pretty normal for most time series DBs, which is that you almost always need a timestamp. I don't even think you could call yourself a time series DB without requiring that. You normally need a measurement, which is really just like a string value for this one, it's server. And you normally need at least one field set, which would be the actual value. For this one, for example, it has CPU and memory. And then with this one, it also has what we call tag sets. Those can be things like string values, like a location. And although it's not shown here, it can also be something like a Boolean, like good or, or bad or, or on or off, et cetera, you know, whatever you might want a true or false value on. So now I'm going to go into Influx more particularly and what we're built with. So this is roughly how it works within the platform. I've talked a lot about the data sources at this point, so I'm not going to repeat myself there. But when it comes to data collection, we, we ingest with multiple methods. I'm going to go into Telegraph and how that works because it is a ingestion agent that actually works with Kafka. We also do have client libraries. I'm not going to go into them here, but basically they just allow you to write code in the language of your choice, like for example, Python or JavaScript. And from there you can uh, put your data into the database and pull it back out. From there it's data storage and transformation. That is obviously what we're big about being a database. That's the biggest thing we deal with. And then finally, uh, outward integrations, data visualization and analysis. Things like machine learning and analytics tools, for example, Power BI, Pandas data frames. Uh, there's a long list here, Grafana as a visualization, for example. We're built on top of the Apache Aero project. All the files that we write are in Parquet format. And we use Data Fusion to allow us to have SQL support. These are all very important key components of our new version that's been available for about the beginning of this year and we'll have an open source luckily by the end of this year. We're, very, we're all very excited for it to be coming out soon. But basically this engine allows us to have a much better compression and ingestion rate which is very, very important as well as that SQL support. Because although this is a NoSQL DB, people still want to be able to query with SQL. It's, if it was a coding language, it would be the most well known, but most people wouldn't call it that. So in case you guys are not aware, Apache Arrow is a framework for defining basically in-memory columnar data store. It claims to be a lot more efficient at just analytical workloads as well as CPU and GPU architectures. So without going too in-depth, because this is not my wheelhouse, I work with it obviously, but it's not, it's not the thing that I work on specifically. Basically, this just makes storage a lot more efficient and a lot smaller as well, much smaller storage footprint, which is important. It also does defragmenting, defragmentating data access across systems. Basically, it means that all of these systems are working within the same file formats and can communicate with each other. So for example, InfluxDB and ClickHouse can communicate and send data thanks to the Apache Arrow project because all of us are either built with it or built to accept it. If I remember correctly, Apache Arrow was actually built originally from the founders of Pandas, and I do believe a few others. I'd have to look back into it, but this is just a quick uh, overview. Apache Parquet is that file format I talked about before. Basically, the big thing here is that it just stores a lot more efficiently and the query runtime is a lot better. I know it might seem strange to compare it to a CSV file, as that's not normally how we compare things, but you have to remember a CSV file is very also bland, like it's just a very easy thing to benchmark against. It's not necessarily just to make Apache Parquet look really good, it's just something that most people compare themselves to. Also, some people still actually use them quite a bit in the data science field, so Apache Parquet is actually becoming really popular within that field because of it, because a lot of people want something that you know, stores a lot better on, for example, S3, and is a lot more cost efficient too, because that's a big deal. 
And these are some of the tools that you would have for a modern OLAP, da OLAP database. Uh, basically, databases like us. Although we're called a time series database, we also kind of uh, fit in this category as well. But as you can see, we're built with the Rust language. Our file format is Parquet, Arrow Arrays, Arrow Data Fusion to allow SQL extensible query engines, network transfers with an Arrow Flight, which I didn't go on into per se, but basically it just allows us to connect with some of those outside tooling that I mentioned earlier. For example, we have a, what we call a Flight SQL connection to Grafana, as well as to things like Power BI. Those are powered by either the Arrow Flight RPC or the Arrow Flight SQL basically just different types of transfers. So let's get into InfluxDB versus Kafka. This is really quick because in all fairness, they're not really comparable, but it's just kind of good to be aware of how they work together. So obviously Kafka is for real-time distributed streaming. InfluxDB is a time series database. Although Kafka can be used for storing things at at, obviously, it can store a little bit. It's not really made for storing forever, as most of us here are aware of. InfluxDB is actually meant to be stored for a much longer time period as a database. And the query languages for us are going to be SQL for the most part. We also have our own called InfluxQL. Kafka doesn't technically have their own language, which is fine because, again, you're mostly streaming yourself into you know, a different framework, or rather a different sync or source, depending on what you're dealing with. So now we can get into Telegraph. So Telegraph is an open source agent for collecting metrics. It's driven by a huge community because we have over 300 input uh, and output collectors, which on the next slide I'll show a few of them because there's too many to name. Um, it's simple to configure. It's meant to be low code and just easy to run. That's all on purpose. Basically, here are a few of the categories of Telegraph plugins. You can see we also offer one for Kafka. But in particular, this is used by a lot of our customers when, like for example, they have you know, an MQTT project, or they have even more specific ones, like they're trying to get information off of their MongoDB database, et cetera. These are some of the wider categories of Telegraph plugins. And even then, this is only about, I'd say, 20 or 30 of them out of 300. One thing to note, this is completely open source in that a lot of these were built by the companies or the products or the people who have a vested interest in taking care of them. So for example, the Docker ones, for example, I know the dev people who work at Docker who take care of that one. And it's also because, funny enough, this can be used with other time series databases. And I think it could actually technically be used with non-time series databases, but it is mainly geared towards time series DBs or NoSQL DBs at the very least, can also use Telegraph as an ingestion agent. So obviously, some people do sometimes ask, like, do I even need to use Kafka? And that's, you know, Kafka is great. It's super good for streaming. Like, I'm not saying you don't use and you just use Telegraph. But it is good to compare them just so then you're aware of how they work differently. Telegraph is just an agent for collecting and reporting metrics and data. And usually, like I said, it does feed into InfluxDB or other time series databases. Kafka obviously can feed into a much, much wider uh, place. It has a lot more sinks, as you might call it. And it also has a lot more sources. I will say that Telegraph doesn't have that many output plugins. It has maybe 30 to 50, versus obviously Kafka probably has, you know, endless, endless sources it could go from. I think Confluent at least has like 50 alone and probably more. It's also a different type of data flow as well. Telegraph is, like I said before, primarily focused on gathering metrics from a variety of sources and then just specifically sending them to just a database. It's really not for like, it's not, it's not gonna be able to store your data per se for very long like Kafka might be able to. It's really gotta have that good connection to just send it onward. Also, Kafka is a lot more configurable than Telegraph is, though I will admit Telegraph is normally very much simpler to set up, but that's just because it doesn't do that much. That's one thing to note here. Now, that being said, Kafka Consumer Input Plugin is a Telegraph plugin made for hooking up to Kafka. So it's very important here. And that once you have your Kafka stream, you can send it to Telegraph. And from there, it will take your Kafka stream. It will basically listen to it. And it will start to input that into the data format that InfluxDB expects. And on the next slide, I'll show some of the data formats that it expects the data to come in with. One thing to note is that this plugin operates as a service endpoint, which means it is continuously listening and waiting for metrics or events to be generated. You don't have to tell it to listen or you don't have to give it a time to listen. It's just constantly awaiting. 
There are also global and plugin configuration options, which allow you to modify your metrics and tags and create aliases. Al aliases. Basically, that means that let's say you have a stream coming in, but you want to start creating a tag on that stream. You basically want to add another value onto it that's something like going to the database InfluxDB or going to this other DB. You just kind of want to add more information to it that you didn't originally have. You could do that here with, uh, with Telegraph. There are also secret stores that handle things like sensitive information. I've never had to use those before, though. And these are a few of the options for the data formats that it's expecting. From what I understand, most people send it in uh, either some kind of JSON value or unshockingly, actually quite a few people do like a Prometheus type of value. It really just depends on obviously what you're getting. For the uh, project that I have, I think it's using JSON. The other thing is we have the Kafka output plugin. So this one's pretty straightforward. It basically takes the data out of Influx and can put it into a Kafka stream. It's a producer for writing data to your Kafka broker. It supports, it supports again, global and plugin specific configuration settings for, again, modifying those metrics, tags, and fields. So as you send your data out to Kafka, again, you could maybe give it an extra tag that says, like, going to the next DB or going onward in life. Who knows what you would maybe possibly want to put. And again, it's going to provide that secrets, secret store support for secure handling options. And I don't really go into this Kafka output. Again, I don't really talk about it because it's not used in a lot of my projects personally. But this is just kind of a little snippet of how the configuration looks. And all Telegraph configurations look like this, where they say output or input, and then they say a dot and then the name. So for example, this one says outputs.kafka. And basically, you just need to tell it which broker you want to send it to. And then you can name the Kafka topic for those messages. It's obviously got a little bit more uh, details on the GitHub page. This was just a short one that I added in here. So this is an actual project using Telegraph and Kafka together. So with this project, uh, the GitHub here is available on this QR code. And I will have this at the end as well, so you don't feel like you have to take the photo right now. But basically, the way it works is we have a fake sensor data, garden sensors. It's, cre it's basically a Python script that's creating fake data for us to ingest into our Kafka stream. Obviously, most of us here would have real data to ingest, but again, this is just a small project. And from there, the Telegraph Kafka consumer plugin is awaiting to consume that data. And then from there, it is writing it into InfluxDB. Now, you might notice in the Telegraph block box, it looks like there's two separate things going on here. It's more like Telegraph itself is uh, manipulating that data that's getting from Kafka and making it, um, what's the word here? It, it makes it valid for InfluxDB. It's basically just doing all the work for you. And then from there, it writes it right in. And for this, it's just going into the InfluxDB garden sensor bucket. To run this, it's extremely simple because we've put it all just in a Docker. So basically, once you run the Docker compose build, it kind of just builds everything up for you. And then from there, it just pretty much runs. The big thing here is just that you're going to need uh, just some basic credentials, a URL, a token, an org, and a bucket. And bucket, in this case, just means database. Basically, you just need these basic things to tell it for Telegraph where you would like it to send your data into. The repo overview, this is super basic. That garden sensor gateway.py is that Python script that uses the Kafka producer class uh, and generates the garden sensor data to the Kafka topic and includes random humidity, temperature, wind, and soil data, some pretty common use cases for influx. We have our Docker file, which creates and gets running that uh, Python file. We also have the Docker Compose, which also creates our containers for Kafka, Zookeeper, Telegraph, and the Garden Sensor Gateway containers. Basically, just gets everything up and running. And then finally, the Telegraph configuration file, which will actually contain your credentials and begins to uh, ingest data from the Kafka topic and write it into InfluxDB. So for example, this is the opposite way. This is the inputs. This one's got the Kafka consumer. It's expecting a Kafka broker because this is running locally. It's expecting it on the local host of 9092. And it's calling the sensor garden sensor data. And it's outputting it into InfluxDB. And for this one, it just happens to be doing it for InfluxDB v2. It's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. But basically, in the future, it'll say v3. But that won't be a big deal. But here, you can see we have a URL, for example. That is just happens to be where I'm hosting in my uh, cloud east. A token, which would be an API token for authentication, and an organization name. That's just all available within either the cloud or the open source, depending on what you're running. 
And then your actual destination bucket is just your DB's name, basically. And then just to explain how the PI file works, which is pretty straightforward, it does the data generation. It's packaging this all within JSON, which is one of the accepted inputs for the Kafka Telegraph input plugin. It has the Kafka producer, and it's got a message sending loop, which is continuously creating that JSON formatted sensor data. So this is just a quick example of how this all works. Like I said, this is super fun and easy to run in the fact that you don't really have to do a whole lot. You just make sure Docker gets up and built and everything just kind of starts to run on its own. It's really quite nice. Those are my favorite kind of projects, are the ones that like, it's just super simple. And this is from our data explorer. Now I'm gonna be clear here, we don't do a lot of our own visualization. A lot of people prefer to use this with Grafana. And I will show a quick example of how you set that up, but this is some of the visualization we offer. It's mainly just to make sure the data is coming in, as you would expect. As you can see here, we have from our garden sensor data, we're getting a measurement of Kafka consumer. And then for this one, we've uh, selected the field of humidity. And from there, we're actually getting the mean value as well. We've selected one of the aggregate functions. So you can just kind of see on the graph. Again, this is random data, so that's why it's jumping around a bunch. Normally, when we deal with a humidity data, it's not so jumpy. Though sometimes we do a fun demo with a plant live and people will get really close to the sensors and basically breathe on them and the humidity will spike like crazy. It's very fun. So Confluent and InfluxDB. So Confluent has options for our V1, which obviously they don't talk about quite as much nowadays, which is fine. They have a V1 sync and a V1 source. Um, I'm gonna be honest, I just pulled this off of the website as to some of the uh, things it offers here for it. I have used the V1 uh, source before, but I haven't really had to play too around too much with these. They also have options for V2 as well. That also has at least once delivery, and it also supports multiple tasks. And when it comes to V3, we're currently working with them on getting that out the door. Now, one thing to note, though, is I was testing the sources and sinks earlier like two or three weeks ago, and I did find that the V1 source and the V2 sync do work with V3. Obviously, it would be great to have a exclusive V3, though, because I'm a little bit worried that it's not quite as efficient as it could be if it was built from scratch, but we're also waiting for the open source to be available at the end of the year, and so that can all kind of kick off together. But I'm really glad that Confluent has these options for everybody. So glad, in fact, that we actually do have a blog going over this integration and how to get it to work. Plus it goes over doing the same with MQTT. This was actually a fun little project where my coworker was comparing basically MQTT to Kafka and how they compared. He's not really comparing them in a way that's like this one's so much more efficient than the other. It's more about just how easy they were to set up and how easy they were, you know, how well they just ran on their own, which is always kind of nice to play around with. It explains how to build both. And this is just a little example of how basically it all worked within the project. As you can see, he had an MQTT broker for one of them, and then he had the Kafka uh, topic and cluster instead for the other, and both of them just ended up writing to InfluxDB. From what I remember, he actually found them both pretty equally efficient, so it was more just about the tooling that you prefer to use and find more comfortable, though I did think, uh, I do believe that Kafka was a little bit more, it had a lot more tooling that you could depend upon to have a more reliable stream. So now I'm gonna go into some company examples. So this is from Hulu. So Hulu originally reduced what they called their tangled Celtic knot stream to a more stable, fast, and durable stream with Kafka and InfluxDB. And it solved a lot of the problems that they were dealing with with their traditional published subscribe models. It specifically was also using Hulu and Kafka to scale over one million metrics per second. And one thing that I didn't write down here is that this is also really nice in that if a cluster for InfluxDB were to go down or have problems, the writer would automatically begin writing to another cluster. As you can see here, how all these arrows are going to both places. That was really nice as a fail safe backup, just in case something were to go wrong, everything would eventually make its way into Influx. So no data would ever be lost. The writer would always work basically. In Wayfair's architecture, Kafka is actually sandwiched more, um, as we just kind of saw in the other projects, it's sandwiched between the telegraph agents. 
There's an output Kafka Telegraph agent that pipes metrics from the application to Kafka, and then a Kafka Consumer Telegraph agent that collects those metrics from Kafka and sends them to InfluxDB. So if I remember correctly, they're actually using Telegraph to use the output plugin to get out of a different type of database or a different type of stream. Because like I said, Telegraph is fully open source, so it's definitely used not just for influx. It's not, we don't like keep it under lock and chain and make it exclusive to us. It's definitely used by both competitors and not just in general, people like to use it. So when they were doing this, it allows them to, um, sorry, this model enables them to connect to multiple data centers, inject processing hooks, and gain multi-day tolerance against severe outages. We had a whole write-up on this. This is just a small piece of it. And also the visualization kind of speaks for itself and makes this a little bit easier to read. But as you can see, they're getting this data via Kafka from not only Seattle, but also from Ireland, filtering it all down to a Kafka uh, consumer in Boston and then finally sending it onward to Telegraph, which then send it, sends it to Influx. So really quick going into Grafana and InfluxDB, so that way then you can kind of wrap everything up and actually visualize. So this is pretty straightforward. For anybody who's used Grafana, you basically just select a data source. And from there, we have our Flight SQL data source. That's the one that we built with them together to accept uh, InfluxDB v3. We also have v2 connectors if you prefer to use the, uh, the current open source that we have, but this is just going to be about Flight SQL. It's pretty straightforward. In fact, the connection is extremely similar to the Telegraph one, where you have your host port, which again is that uh, URL. You have a token, and then you have your bucket name, which is your, again, database name, and then you just put the value in for it. Uh, just, just one thing to note here, we have our, our top tips. You always want to make sure that you have a token that has read permissions enabled, so then you can read the data out of your database. In general, when I make a token, I tend to make it both read and write because I end up using it in multiple places where that would be appropriate. From there, you just select time series as a visualization. And then you use the time range to actually get uh, so basically with this one, you're using a SQL query to select the time and fuel with the generator ID, um, with the generator ID basically being the, uh, sorry guys, the, the unique value here from gen data where the time range is a specific range. And time range is a Grafana global variable that allows you to make your time ranges dynamic. So you basically can manipulate them within the UI. And then from there, you just want to navigate to transform. And just a heads up, this is all available online. I'm going to have a QR code for this. Just makes it a little bit easier for everyone to follow. And this is what you would end up with. So by doing the generator ID as the unique value, those are all the different colored lines here. As you can see, we get the fuel for generators one, two, and three. And this is just a pretty simple hookup. It's great. People love using Grafana for visualization. Obviously, we also suggest it as well. And this is one of the try it yourselves. So that's one thing to know also is we have a ton of projects obviously available. And for a lot of people, you can use it not just with Influx. We have projects that you know, work with a lot of our connectors, like I've already shown the ones with Kafka and Confluent. But just in general, this is just where we keep them all for at least some of our quick starts, as we call them. So going into resources. So these are the project QR codes. So for example, that was that Kafka input uh, plugin, the Kafka output plugin, the Kafka and Telegraph project, which was the big one I went through, and then the Confluent project, which was the one I just briefly mentioned. The blog does have all the code uh, on GitHub available in with it, within it. It's just nice to have context. We also have a try it yourself. So this one I've already kind of mentioned. That's going to our main website. And the other one is going to Influx Community, which is where all the projects I've mentioned live, uh, except for Telegraph, which lives in its own special uh, place. It's not, within, uh, it's not within Influx community. <laughs> it's way beyond us, that's for sure. And then for just some further resources, these are just a little easier to read. Uh, we also have our community Slack. So again, if you have any questions after this or you ever need help with anything, please feel free to join us in the Slack. Even if it's something not with Influx, but just in general, we, we are always there to answer questions on Grafana. And we've answered plenty of questions on Kafka as well in general, or Telegraph. Uh, we have our GitHub, which has the Influx community, as well as just in general, all of our code bases live there, uh, all of our open source and such. We have really good docs. They're really well written and very easy to read, thank goodness. And then we also have Influx DB University, which offers free learn at your own pace courses where you can learn about things such as Telegraph, as well as Influx itself. 
and that is the end of my presentation.